from hardware um, security type of access, door access, things of that nature tonight. Um, and then the lab, the lab for Thursday is going to be man and mill attack. Man and mill attack is the one I think I mentioned the first week. Um, it's one I probably, not that I haven't spent time on all of them, but this one I spent the most time on over the years, uh, just making it um, more efficient each semester. Um, and the lab, lab pertain, when you guys will come in, I'll use the probably the PC Daniels app to set up as a hack machine. It'll be the man in the middle hacker. And then everybody will come in and I'll have you go to www.facebook.com, log in with bogus credentials, username, password. Then I'll kill the man in the middle attack and then have you come over to that, this machine and show you the day that was collected <coughs> in that two, three minute time period. Um, the whole setup can be done outside of uh, the lab uh, once you know how to do it in under about a minute and a half on any Wi-Fi access point that's open that users use. And that could be from, you know, and I'm just thinking off the top of my head, I know most of them because last semester in the uh, Ethical Hacking Club, we did a um, five mile radius from Rock Valley and I gave them all different types of software to use, whether they had a droid, iPhone, um, laptop. There's all different types of open source free software to use to track open SSIDs and close SSIDs. And when we brought it back, it generated a map that pinpointed where everything's located. And then when you hover over the pin, it gave the SSID, whether it was open or closed. I think red was closed, green was open. And if I'm not mistaken, um, let's see if I can bring up that site real quick. Is this, is this last Saturday? No, we did it last semester right. on a site. We do it on a Saturday. And I want to get started again. I've just been so busy this semester. I'd like to get started up doing at least one or two this semester, maybe. Well, you didn't do it this last Saturday. No, we didn't. No. Oh, cool. I thought I missed it. Nope, we didn't. Uh, war driving, maybe that's it. Um, yeah, here it is. So here is the, um, it was Saturday, March 1st, last, last year. Oh, it says here almost 20% of were open or web access. Um, they had a blast and within five miles. So 20% of the, the access points that were collected were web and or open, one of the two. And so you could just get in. And what they had to do basically in war driving, if you've ever heard of that term, is basically just driving around a city and collecting data to uh, report back to the group what your findings were. And then like in Vegas, they have one every year to where they, they report back to all the businesses and say, here's the report of your biz, of your city, of where you're at health-wise. And then they can, you know, over the years, as you can imagine, the compliance of getting their Wi-Fi access points secure has increased, you know, they've gotten better because of having these war driving events. And it's fun to do. It's, you know, you definitely, you're not doing this when you're driving, you stop for that, but you have it in your car seat or whatever. And there's a different um, different types of tools. I'm thinking about doing this one. If I can only do one this semester, they had a lot of fun with this. We had about 10 students involved. There was a couple of community members that came in too. It was kind of cool. Um, it is a fun lab to do if you've never done one. Because um, you, I give you the instructions when you come in, make sure all the software is running, then just let you go at it. They have four different quadrants to go from Rock Valley. Um, I think they went all the way to Alpine this way and then, or take it back four stills this way. And then here we stopped at, um, at 90, stopped at 90 here. And then went furthest this way was to, I believe to a uh, state. And then here went all the way to 251, I believe. <clears throat> and so, um, anyway, it was a lot of fun. So if there's any, uh, one I'd like to do, I'll probably pick that one. And I'm thinking April might be a good time to do it after spring break, the, the Saturday in April maybe. So that'll get everybody over spring break, get that done. So would you guys be interested in doing something like that? Yeah. And it, it's just Saturday from like nine to nine to noon. Um, and I'll buy pizza and everything. We'll come back and, and look at the data that's collected once it's come back and make little charts and stuff with Excel spreadsheets and everything. And so I'll probably do that in April, we'll do that. So and anyway, we're gonna be doing, um, the man in the mill attack, the reason I talked about the war driving is the man in the mill attack utilizes 
hackers will go out and do a, a war drive of the city. If it's a new city they don't know about, they'll do a war drive to determine what the open access points are in that city. And man in the middle attacks, I guess when people hear, they, they initially think it's just for uh, cafes and stuff, like for free Wi-Fi. But man in the middle attacks are also done in residential and business areas as well that have open or folks have cracked their, their web uh, key, which is easy to do. Um, with this type of attack. And what happens is, let's, let's give an example of residential. Hackers will um, find out web, open web uh, areas, go to those areas, scan it with something uh, like Wireshark to determine what, what pages are visiting, what websites are visiting. Then they'll actually do a man-in-the-middle attack on those pages. Okay, like say the man-in-the-middle, when I mean pages, I mean websites. So they'll do like a man in the middle attack on a banking website that these people go to all the time. Say if they bank it, I don't know, Citibank or wherever, uh, be, you know, BMO or whatever. And doing, uh, you know, they'll create a fish website, a BMO, uh, do a man in the middle attack at 8 o'clock on a whatever night that they know people are usually going to that at this house and uh, get their account information. And then within, if you have account information, some banks allow you to do wire transfers uh, with that account and you know with some verification of some type or none depending on the bank uh, and they could transfer money from your bank to their place overseas that they've set up and wipe your bank account out and that's happened multiple times um, and same with businesses same deal happens so that would be an extreme scenario um, and then you know Hacks, uh, they'll do a lot of times, hackers will just be to deface people's Facebook pages, Twitter pages, use getting their account information with man in the middle. And the one on Thursdays, we're just going to be using uh, Facebook. We're going to be focusing on that. And what it'll do is over a few minutes time, um, it's going to, uh, once it's turned on and uh, we we'll do what's called an art poisoning, it'll poison the art tables to where um, everybody, when they log in to their machines and are browsing the web, the man in the middle machine will be one filtering all that traffic. And basically, when you type in Facebook.com, it will be going to the attack machine and collecting all the data on a nice SQL database using ZAMP web server. So um, we'll be doing that on Thursday. As soon as, you, as soon as you come in, we'll be playing with that. And Chapter 5 this week is what we're going over on network defenses and review questions for chapter five. So let's go ahead and bring up the PowerPoint here. Get started. <clears throat> okay. We're gonna stop on like slide 38 or 39 or 40, somewhere around there. Um, this one's basically talking about uh, ways to secure a host computer, different types of application securities, uh, application security definition, and then explain how to secure data using what's called loss prevention. So in securing a host, um, and when we say host, we mean like a web server. Um, it could actually be a client, but mostly it's gonna be a server of some type. You can run like say websites from a regular client machine or any application from a regular client machine. But there's three things to secure, the host itself that's running the app, the app itself and the data that's on the host that's being collected. It could be a database from SQL, to, uh, it could be a database, um, XML database, it could be any type, it could be a flat database, Securing the host involves protecting the physical device itself, so that means proximity around the device needs to be secure. Um, so your server rooms should be secure, some form or fashion, locked up. Not just anybody can get in. Usually it's best to have it logged as well, who goes in and out of the server room somehow. And if you're using proximity cards, that works well. Securing the operating system software, the best way to do that is to have a very secure password okay, on that machine to where only a few people know it. Um, and it's not, uh, and it has changed quite often, which a lot of IT departments never change their admin passwords. It's the same forever. And so, and those of you who have been in IT in a period of time already know that. And that's probably one of the biggest 
uh, downfalls from most IT departments. They never change their password. Unless something really critical happens, really drastic happens, then things are changed. Like say somebody threatens to delete all your data and then they leave the business and they're a, an IT manager or something. The, uh, then you would, they change the password. But beyond that type of event, most IT departments keep the same admin password for years. So I'm having a good secure password that's changed often using security-based software applications, monitoring logs are just some ways that we'll talk about. So on preventing a securing devices, I'm preventing authorized, unauthorized access to a machine, to a server, um, you've got physical access security, um, most hardware security, and mobile device security. And so you got the physical, the host, and the mobile, different types of devices. And like on our machines in here, on our servers throughout the building, they're all mounted with uh, steel cables just for prevent somebody from stealing them. But beyond that, in this room, we have the proximity um, card doors. So people cannot get in without those. And then we also have a, an alarm in here, a silent alarm that goes off in 30 seconds if it's not keyed in. So both of our Cisco labs have that. A few of the classrooms around campus do, like I believe over the teacher biology, they have cadavers and stuff in those rooms. They have, you know, those are secure as well. And any type of medicines or any type of uh, chemicals, those are going to be secure. But, you know, with the mobile device security, that's kind of a new one on the horizon last couple of years on how do we secure mobile devices. There are companies that just specialize in creating an ecosystem for mobile device security, kind of a data wrapper around all your mobile device applications and making sure it's secure in a cloud type of environment. Physical security, the way to do that is basically just restricting access is the easiest way to do it. And you know, some businesses aren't gonna be able to afford a big room with proximity card, but you know, they might be able to you know, put it in a room that, that, that's locked at least with a key and you can do that or in a, a broom closet, whatever it is they can afford to do, at least do something to restrict access to that equipment. Because if somebody would get a hold of that equipment, as we learned in like the NT Reset Lab, they could actually go in and do some damage pretty quickly if they have physical access to that server. So hardware locks is one way, just a standard lock. Deadbolt, again, not real expensive to do. You know, for each door, about 20 bucks to get us up a cheap deadbolt lock type of system. And then making sure only a few folks have the master keys for that. And then key locks can be compromised if the keys are lost, stolen, or duplicated. And there it goes, you know, you're going to have to maybe ever so often uh, do key change out, which again, it might is not going to be as expensive as a proximity door type of setup, which in that you have to deal with the hardware proximity device, the battery, the computer system, somebody going around, make sure everything works. So the way these work here is you can, you can enter in by key, key keypad, or proximity card, either one. It does have a battery in these doors, and the batteries go low, can't get in, or the batteries die, they can't get in um, to these doors. And so uh, they start blinking like red. We have to let people know in security so they can change those batteries out. So here's just some screenshots of normal door, deadbolt, key entry type of uh, access. So recommended key management procedures. If you use key management, change locks after key loss or theft. Uh, I know some businesses change locks after every employee that had those keys leaves the building, leaves that business. They'll change locks. This is fairly inexpensive to do, um, especially if you're just, doing, you know, you're just doing it towards a server room or whatever uh, in your building. Inspect locks frequently and regularly to make sure there's been no tampering. Issue keys only to authorized users. Um, keeping record of who uses and turns in keys, keeping track of issued keys. Master keys should not have them identifying marks. And most key uh, places that uh, create keys are not supposed to duplicate uh, master keys, but I know that you can find places that do. We'll go, we'll only look at the key and just have some kid run it and they'll just duplicate anything. And so, but you know, there's a few places that don't like, but again, you, you're not in control of that as a business. Um, now, one of the men, one of it doesn't mention on the slide is some places will actually some managers might give their employees a key, and they shouldn't have a key, and maybe the owner of the business doesn't know that. 
Does that happen? For sure, that definitely happens. Um, so you just have to keep track of who has those keys. Goes on, it says uh, securing unused keys in a safe lock, uh, un uh, lock safes, uh, set up monitoring procedure of some type, marking duplicate master key with do not duplicate, duplicate, wipe out manufacturer serial number, prevent duplicates from being ordered. And then cipher lock, this is a more sophisticated alternative to key lock, is a combination of sequences uh, necessary to open the door. It can be programmed to allow a code in. You might have used these like a four pin code, seven pin code, whatever. It records when the door's open by which code. And like HR can determine when you came in, when you left with these type of doors. You don't have to clock in or clock out, which most IT folks are on salary because you can work some weeks 80 hours, some weeks 40 hours. And, you know, regardless of what you work, uh, they're going to know when you come in and out of the building. It can be vulnerable to sol shoulder surfing because people can look over your shoulder. Um, don't see that a big danger in this one, but it's, it is it is a could happen, I guess. And then often used in conjunction with tailgate sensor. Uh, tailgate sensor basically uh, being able to go in and, um, you know, having a cipher lock, some type of uh, uh, sensor nearby, whether it be a camera, whether it be a car with a camera, a building with a camera that's zoned in on a door to um, uh, record people going in and out of that door. So here's what one looks like. Ours is a little different. Ours is like, I think, a nine keypad or something. I can't remember. I never use it. I had my code a long time ago. I never use it. I always use them, the uh, card. <clears throat> Alternative methods uh, access would be a physical token, like an ID badge as your photo, emits a signal, a proximi proximity card reader like we have here. The another one's kind of cool is RFID tags. These are the tags that are actually used in the stores for if you buy big electronic equipment or whatever, out of these, or even clothing, I think has them on there. So expensive clothing, RFID tag, and if you don't, they don't take it off when you buy it, it, it buzzes when you go out the door, or it should. These can also be used as well um, to when a, it can be affixed inside the badge, read by a proximity reader. The way I've wanted to use this, I'm not a chance to use it, is to create some type of app to where, in uh, healthcare is where the idea came that I had was uh, because of all the laws with doctors logging in and out, is to uh, have a way for them to do it easily yet securely. And if they had a, an RFID tag badge, um, they could log in and out easier. Um, and they walk away, it logs them out. And so anyway, that's just one thought on proximity reader. Here's what one looks like on a tag. It's just a little dot on the back of the tag in this case. And uh, you can buy them online. You can buy the readers online too and develop different use cases for it. This one here is just a man trap. Basically, you're going in one door maybe. Um, and say the other door has a different access code or a different way to get in and that hacker doesn't have it, they're going to be locked inside of that uh, room. You won't see these unless you're in a governmental facility or military facility, but they are out there. Access list is basically just a record of individuals that have permission to enter a secure area. It rec records the time they entered and left. A man trap separates a secure from a non-secure area. Uh, it monitors and controls two interlocking doors. Only one door may open at a time. Video surveillance is everywhere. We got it everywhere, whether we like it or not, uh, from uh, airports to grocery stores to banks. Everywhere you go where there's any financial transactions occurring, more than likely you're going to have be videoed in that transaction. Uh, all ATMs pretty much have a modern ATMs will have a video video recording everything that's being happening during the transaction. Um, video cameras transmit signal to a limited set of receivers. Cameras may be fixed or be able to be moved. Uh, I worked in security going through college and we had movable pin uh, hole security cameras where we could put anywhere in the building to secure a certain or record a certain area that we might think that is happening. And we caught people everywhere from maintenance that were stealing coins out of secretary's drawers, 
you know, like change and, uh, you know, could be petty cash or whatever to more bigger uh, uh, theft, like somebody stealing a vehicle out of the maintenance pool or something like that. And so using types of uh, movable cameras. And they've gotten cheaper over the years too, to where even a lot of home users now have closed circuit television to where they can use an iPhone or a droid to remote into your house to see what's going on uh, while you're gone. Fencing, having some type of secure fencing around the perimeter. You'll see some governmental and uh, healthcare facilities have this depending upon, say it's a healthcare facility for psychiatric patients. Um, they'll have that as well, where they're maybe don't want anybody to escape uh, because they're a danger to themselves and to society. You actually will see this a lot, believe it or not, even in in um, elderly care facilities. Uh, and you think that's kind of cruel, but um, and I don't. I'm not a big believer, by the way, in um, old folks' home because some of them, if you probably read reports and heard reports, are not treated too well. I had first-hand experience. My mom had to be in one for a few days, and we weren't happy with how she was treated. But there's some good ones out there for sure. But, the, you know, the good ones that, you know, uh, are out there, you know, they'll have sometimes these little tags on the, on the patients. But I know my father-in-law, his dad, was in one of the last few years of his life, and he told me he, he got called out how many times a week to go up because – his dad would run away in his underwear <laughs> in the middle of the night and it'd be like five blocks away from the, uh, from the nursing home and always had to bring him back and it'd be kicking and screaming, coming back. Uh, so, you know, you, you say, well, fences, they might even get hurt. Yeah. They could definitely probably get hurt. You know, I'm getting bound up in, bar, in barbed wire or something. I don't know. Uh, but you know, they even have in the nursing homes, little buzzers that go off and alarms that go off when these patients leave the building. But you know, these guys get smart about it. They know how to, they, they, they figure out how to hack it and figure out how to get around it and, you know, leave their beeper on a tray or something or on a the house dog or something like that. And it's going around the campus and they're gone for a while and then they come back. So uh, even the best securing uh, method can be hacked. The most secure can be hacked because you have people working there, right? And they're going to figure it out. At least have something. Uh, it goes on to some, <laughs> some, I think, kind of humorous uh, fencing deterrence. anti climb paint. Might not have heard of that before. It's a non-toxic petroleum gel-based paint that is thickly applied and does not harden, making any coated surface very difficult to climb. Kind of like a Vaseline on a wall or something. Uh, typically used on poles, down, down pipes, wall tops, railings uh, above head height, like eight feet. anti climb collar. It's a spiked collar that extends horizontally for three feet from the pole, prevent anyone from climbing. You've seen these before. They kind of extend the, extend the uh, range of the fence and kind of at an angle with maybe barbed wire on it. Uh, that's a popular one. Then uh, roll bear, independently rotating large cups uh, affixed to the top of the fence, preventing uh, in hands of intruders from gripping the top of the fence or climbing over it. Often found in public grounds and schools where non-aggressive behavior or barriers important. And then rotating spikes installed top of walls, gates, or fences. Uh, Tri-wing spikes, collars rotate around the central spindle and can be painted and bend, blend with the fences. So going on with physical security, uh, now we go to hardware on the physical side, hardware security. Physical security protects the server, mainly in IT. Portable devices, though, like in here, can be bracketed with steel bracket security slots. They're very cheap, by the way. The slots are very cheap to install on your monitors, keyboard. Your monitors, not keyboard, but monitors and PC. Keyboard mouse generally is not going to be cable down. Cable can then be locked and secured to a desk to become a mobile. Laptops placed in a safe place. Um, and then locking cabinets for people to business to put stuff in there and roll it away and lock it up for security. Here's what a laptop one looks like. I worked at a place years ago that we had these on our laptops and at the end of the night, it looked like an old, I used to do vending for years when I, I did a lot of stuff going through school, but vending was one where, you know, and you guys know what I'm talking about, the little vending key that you go, know, that's what these look like. And, you know, you pop it in and it comes out and they're actually not that hard to find these keys, by the way. So hackers, you know, can find these fairly easy. So 
But, you know, most 99.9% of people aren't going to have these in their back pocket uh, to use. Uh, mobile device security, continuing on with that, as many security provisions apply to laptops, apply to mobile. Here's some really popular ones. These two. The first one actually is more popular than the second, but it is both popular. Remote wiping and sanitation. Okay. What that means is somebody spills your droid, your iPad, you can track it where it's at as soon as it has internet connection and do a remote wipe of that data or do a remote um, GPS tracking of where it's found when they connect. Um, it can pinpoint within 100 meters of the location of where they're at. And it works. I've act, act, every semester I loan out iPads to students. And last semester, a student uh, didn't steal it, but he uh, forgot to uh, disconnect his account from the iPad. And so what he did was I had him log into his account on me.com. I was at my house. He could see my location. And he, he remoted in and wiped the machine. I had him wipe it and take his account out so I could actually go in and do something with it. And so um, I got to see, I guess, on the other end of it. Um, I have wiped it on that end, you know, controlling a, uh, an iPhone or iPad. And um, you can also get that information to law enforcement. And they're smart enough and they know enough now to where they can track down that individual. A story I'll share in, our, in Rockford at a business where a person took an iPad from a business after they quit kept using it, they were supposed to turn it in. Well, they had the uh, find me on the iPad turned on. Um, uh, the person had to have known, but evidently they didn't because usually when people's trying to steal something, they do stupid stuff. Um, anyway, he was driving around Rockford, just had his iPad on his seat in his car and it was connected. It was one of those iPads that cellular built into it. And uh, so the police pulled him up, pulled him over. He was, you know, he wasn't speeding and all this stuff. And they go, what what did you pull me over for? He goes, uh, you have a company iPad in your car. Oh, yeah. Yeah, go, you didn't know what he's talking about. But anyway, they uh, they took the iPad because the company said if he gives it up and doesn't lie about it or doesn't say it's not his, then just take it and that'll be it. And that's what he did. He said, okay, well, here's the iPad. The cop took it and went on his way. They gave him a little talking to, though. But uh, beyond that, he didn't get any trouble beyond that. So, so it does work. And um, I do recommend if you have any devices, mobile, and it doesn't have to be Apple, it could be Droid as well. They both have these services on there to where you can turn it on. That way if somebody steals your device and they ever get connected to the internet at any point in time, you can then remote wipe the data. And, but what I recommend doing is, I like what I've done in the past was device been stolen is before you wipe the data, find out where they're at and see if you can see if you can gather that device. See if you can get it. Now, nine times out of 10, you're probably not going to be able to that, you know, because people, um, hackers that steal and people that just steal these devices, there are ways to go in and wipe these out and to clean them and all this good stuff to where it can take out, if they know what they're doing, uh, this piece of, piece of, uh, uh, service the remote white sanitation service very difficult by the way in newer versions of os like ios 8 very difficult to do not impossible but very very difficult to do um, because the way it works in ios 8 now is if you bought a stolen ipad from somebody like say from ebay or whatever when you try to set it up if that person that it was stolen from had this set up or had an iCloud tied to it, you can't even set up an operating system. It won't let you. It'll say enter in whatever password, and you'll be like, I, I never set anything up on this. And the reason it's saying that is because it's still in the ownership of that person uh, that had it before. And the only way around it is to find out who this person was and have them come in and detach their name from that iPad. And so there's tons of black market iPads out there and droids, I'm guessing, as well people selling them on eBay once they've stolen them. In fact, I don't know if you heard a while back in Chicago, there was a big thing where kids would go around and steal people's iPads and iPhones, because they're usually iPhones that walk around and then go sell them on eBay or sell them on uh, Craigslist. You ever heard about like an iPhone mod or something like that? I can't watch this. <laughs> Attack all ladies, take an iPhone. You know, it's kind of stupid. <laughs> but anyway, 
uh, you don't hear much about it anymore, but when they first came out and when new phones come out, generally that's what happens. Also voice encryption, which uh, this one, I've not experienced this one, but I know people that have on their droids, actually, they, they do this pretty good. They have some software where you can uh, use to mask the content of your voice communication over a smartphone. Um, and what's called voice encryption can be used as well. So five steps to protecting your operating system. Uh, we went from the hardware, now we're to the software part. First is develop a, some type of security policy. Uh, perform a uh, software baseline, determining uh, what your software needs as far as updates on a re regular basis. Configure the security settings, which uh, it's amazing how many IT departments when I get a new piece of software. Don't set the security settings on the software. Just, you know, it works. We're, we're using it. Done. Uh, deploy the settings, meaning let those settings be out there in a location like... Uh, Place in Rockford, what we did was I created a, is actually an iPad app to search any documentation that they had for IT, uh, and they could be anywhere. They could just VPN in through the app and then search for, say, how to set up a new iPad or a new iPhone, and they could securely go into the documentation and find it out and go through step by step procedure of how to do it. It takes time to do all that, but bless you, doesn't, it's going to help tremendously when it comes to deploying. And protecting operating systems and then implementing some type of patch management to where you know when stuff's going to be updated and you're going to do some testing of some type before you update it usually on some type of uh, uh, virtual machine or if it's if it's a mobile device on a mobile device off the grid of course it's not going to hurt anything it's not a product production device and so just have some type of patch management in place and then the security policy is making documents. And that's where a lot of IT departments kind of fall by the wayside on clearly defining what your defense mechanisms are um, and documenting those to where you can look at it. If Joe's gone and he's the one over, I don't know, setting up a secure email for a new person uh, and the documents haven't been created to do that for your place of business, then you have to wait to to come back. And so creating some type of document to define not only how to set up, but let's say we get a virus, what are we going to do? What's the procedures to uh, guard from this virus spreading? Performing host software baseline, basically what the word baseline means is some standard or checklist against systems that can be evaluated. Microsoft has what's called a Microsoft baseline analysis tool that you can use for all Microsoft products. It'll tell you from a network perspective where all your stuff is as far as uh, updates, patches, things like that. Also configurating uh, settings to be used on each computer and organization. This is where Active Directory would come in well to do an Active Directory uh, uh, group policy for each user on your location or each group of users. So it's a separate one for marketing, separate one for programmers, separate one for uh, network folks, separate one for HR. So regardless of where they log in on the network, on what machine, all those rights and privileges are going to be sucked down from group policy editor. And hundreds of different software security settings can be manipulated. Only warning I'll give you on this is, uh, big warning here, if you're doing group policy playing around, you can lock yourself out. I've done it over the years when I was first learning uh, how to use it. Uh, so I recommend if you're playing with group policy editor, which is a cool tool to use and to learn, um, is you keep the group policy editor open and just do one by one as you're playing with it. And then you can just enable a policy and see what it, if it works. And while group policy editor screens up, you can disable that policy. Does that make sense? So you kind of see how it works and then back out of it. And then typical configuration baselines would be changing insecure default settings like uh, passwords. An example would be on Windows machines, disabling the guest account. All right, that's a, that's a simple one that you could do. Eliminating unnecessary software services like disabling messages services, even though Microsoft has patched that service years ago, it still could be uh, backdoor uh, by some type of tools. And so 
if you're not using protocols like FTP, or if you're not using Microsoft uh, messaging services, which most people aren't, you can disable those. Microsoft chat messages, you can turn that off. Enabling uh, your firewall. Now there's some apps that actually do not work as much as you try to configure them, they might not work with firewall enabled on some machines. And that's where your internal firewall on your router is gonna help you and save you on that. Because uh, there are some applications I've come across over the years, that regards to what you do, uh, for whatever reason, something doesn't work right on some uh, third party app that somebody created for your business. Um, and you might have to turn the firewall off on those machines in that instance. I've had to do that before. Deploying the settings, basically I recommend, it doesn't say it here, but deploying the settings in my mind means deploying it to something like an Active Directory to where you can deploy those group policies to uh, a network resource. It's not on any machine, one machine, it's on a global um, you know, server. And then group policy does mention here about centralized uh, management of all your computers, which I highly recommend. Because other than group policy, if you don't do a group policy on your network, you're having to configure each machine individually one by one, which, you know, you can do, but it's a, it's a nightmare to do. It's really a headache, those of you who had to do it before. Um, so group policy is very powerful to use. Um, operating systems have increased in size, as you know, over the years and complexity. The lines of code have increased about a million per iteration, a million to five million lines of code per iteration of Windows. And because of that, there's going to be new attack tools that come out to attack vulnerabilities in a current version, or even an older version, or even a beta version. And that's where security patches come in to help um, keep those things locked down. Here's an example of lines of code in different operating systems. Uh, Linux 5 million, FreeBSD 9, Red Hat 30, Windows 7 50, Mac 10 4, 86 million. Debian, which is a version of Linux, uh, 324 million. And Debian basically is, um, you might have heard of uh, Ubuntu. That's a Debian version of Linux. It's very popular. And it's a secure operating system. Um, hot fixes, these are just some terminologies with different types of patches. Hot fixes address a certain customer, like I mentioned here, you know, University of Wisconsin Madison. Wisconsin Madison has tons of hot fixes for their specific location. Um, maybe, I don't know, Sears has custom. We might even have custom uh, hot fixes for our location. Service packs or accumulation of security updates. And how to implement these, um, I do not recommend on a network performing automatic updates. I recommend some third party type of patch deployment and that way you can test them in your IT environment and then deploy them at your leisure when you're ready to employ them. And I go as far as turning off um, updates from being accessed from, Microsoft updates from being accessed from any PC on your environment. It should be totally controlled by IT because patches can create new problems as the last bullet mentioned. So on this screen here, I would definitely turn that off. And inside of Active Directory, by the way, and in Group Policy, you can disable this from even being seen on a machine. They can't even get into the setting. They can't get into any setting that you don't want them to get into, and this would be one you wouldn't want them to get into. Um, so it gives some advantage here, which I already told you, my feelings on updates, and so um, for home users, I think you're fine for the most part on a, automatic updates. But for and you're in a, in a uh, network of computers, I don't recommend it. So we have here vendor uh, Microsoft here at the top, and we have uh, a patch pushed down from the vendor Microsoft, and they're pushed and deployed to the clients at say 3 a.m. every morning. And that's usually the default time, Microsoft. If you don't touch it, that's what they usually have in the setup for your operating systems to be set up. And for home users, it's fine. Um, any other users, off the hours, like 5, 30, 6, 7, 8 o'clock at night, tell your people to leave your machines on, use the automatic climate uh, uh, deployment client, 
And the one we use here on campus, it can push any patch from any product, not just Microsoft. So we use Microsoft, Adobe, um, you know, Visual Studio, AutoCAD, you know, you name it, it's in the patch. And we can push it out at say eight o'clock at night after it gets through patching. On most patches, when you uh, update them, it asks you to restart the machine. At the end of the patch, it will restart that client. And so when the users come in the morning, they've got the patches updated and they log in and you know have all the newest and greatest updates. And let's talk about securing the anti-malware software. Now Microsoft does have a fairly good built-in uh, anti-malware, antivirus. I don't know if you've used it or not. Anybody use a Microsoft uh, virus, antivirus and malware on your machines? Do I know? The security essentials. Code? Yeah, security essentials. Yeah. Anybody use that? It's fairly good. It's it's not too bad. Um, and so I, I tell people if you don't have anything else, get use that, turn it on, and use it. Uh, you know, begin begin using it, uh, especially home users. Most business users are going to buy some commercial product like McAfee or Norton to to use, which definitely definitely recommend that as well. Uh, they're both about the same. You know, there's going to be plus and minuses to both. But basically just searches a computer uh, at a certain point in time every day for infections. Put a USB drive in, search for infections. Uh, email infections, searches for. Uh, reads, reads content of email, subject line, content of attachments. Um, and you can tweak that, by the way, on how you want it, what you want it to do. Uh, I, the, only, the only word of warning or wisdom here, I guess, however you want to take it, is making sure your patch deployment's done and your scans are done at a time of day that's off uh, peak time. So you wouldn't done, wouldn't done like at 9 a.m. in the morning to scan or noon. Um, you know, usually, because uh, usually noon is when people try to do stuff on their computer during break. Uh, the times I find for if it's a 9 to 5 type job, you know, do it like 5, 30, 6 o'clock at night. It's a good time. And then that way it's off, it's off uh, their time because it does slow down the process of the computer, box it down a little bit. Um, and sometimes screens pop up and people get confused. They don't know what the screen is that's popping up. And they call IT and like, oh, it's just an update happening. So you definitely don't want that done during uh, production time. And then they have also uh, weaknesses of antivirus, like a vendor must continually search for new viruses, update and distribute signature files, which are called DAT files in most antivirus uh, companies. And then it has an alternate approach, which is code emulation which is questionable code will be executed in what's called a sandbox. It says virtual here, but you might have heard the term sandbox environment. Like uh, where basically it sees something that might be weird, it puts it in a sandbox environment until it finds out otherwise, right? Uh, a good example of that would be Java. Java does a pretty good job of, if it sees a Java applet out there that's not signed or doesn't know where it came from, it'll put it in a sandbox Java environment for you. Um, and there are some antivirus companies that are using sandbox environment as well to, to run code to see uh, until it knows it's not going to affect anything on the PC. Anti-spam. You say, I never see spam. You don't because it's filtered. <laughs> okay. Uh, 90 plus percent of all businesses, most business averages around 97% spam. Between 95 and 97% of junk email. Right, Viagra uh, is number one. Number two, I believe, last I checked, was um, um, another prescription drug. I can't remember off the top. Cialis, I think it is. You know, Viagra, Cialis is the top two that are spammed all the time from markers all over the world. Spam can be used for social engineering attacks um, to get people's information. And by the way, the, the number one way networks are attacked still today is social engineering not through uh, the hacking skills of Kevin Mitnick. It's through social engineering. And basically people knowing how to talk, right? People know how to fast talk. Anybody been in sales before in here? Sales? Yeah. Have you ever met a good salesperson that could literally sell you anything? I'm serious. My dad was pretty good at it. I'm, I, I think I'm okay, but my dad was awesome. He could sell anything uh, to anybody. I'm like, okay, this person doesn't need that. What are you talking about? I'm like, okay, well, they might. No, well, they don't need it. <laughs> you know? And so, you know, a good salesperson can literally sell anything. And so, same thing with spammers. If it's a, 
uh, they target audiences like, say, for instance, uh, target audience today for most uh, spam mail is between 50 and 65 years of age. Okay, the reason being is those that age racket, like it or hate it, their kids are gone, they don't visit often or ever, and they're alone. They're lonely, uh, and so they the spammers know this, and so they get an email that says subject line, "Hey." How's it going? Mm -hmm. Well, they click and open it up and start reading. They're like, hey, this person's willing to email me. They don't even know me. Oh, yeah. I'm, you know. And so, you know, that's how it gets started. Right? And so, social engineering through emailing just by simple. A lot of them are not uh, very tech savvy either. So. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. They they give just, a credit card information out. They just. Yeah, and a big one actually is a by the phone actually where, I don't know if you heard about it, I in Rockford actually, it was on the news while back, where this, uh, the spammers were basically um, the scammers, spammers, whatever you want to call it, scammers in this case, will call up an elderly person and say, I'm your great-great-grandson, uh, you know, Derek, from uh, I'm stuck in Mexico, and I want to know if you could, uh, you know, wire to me to Walmart here, you know, a grand so I can get out of here because I have no food and yada yada and they give this big sob story and people fall for it yeah. because they can find out people's information on on family pretty easy on Google and they do have a grandson named Gary, you know Derek that maybe lives in Texas and they haven't talked to in 20 years and they know a little bit of information to give them and they they do it and so that's social engineering the other way spam is filtered is through uh, different filtering methods like blacklist, whitelist, um, and there's different types of uh, spam filters out there. Barracuda would be the number one that's out right now. It's, it's a de facto uh, email filter, and they're constantly having to come up with ways to filter email because <coughs> these um, marketers that send spam spend millions of dollars a week on sending spam. It's a, it's a science. It's not just an art, it's a science. They know how to do it to where, you know, they, they create new emails with spam, uh, you know, it's, it's black, blacklisted, that domain's blacklisted. Say the domain is at Cialis.com um, and they find out it's spam. Well, it doesn't take too long for uh, all the spam filters to catch that, put in their spam filter list, and then 24 hours they have a, you know, at Cialis1.com or whatever. And they just keep changing it all the time. Blocking file attachments like executables is important. Um, people don't know this a lot of times, but you can change the executable to whatever. You can change the executable to .jpg. And if it doesn't actually go into the file to see the contents of the file, the binary contents, uh, and you're checking extension, uh, it can still be an executable that can actually be repackaged and ran and do some damage on the machine. Pop-ups, you don't hear much anymore, but they're still out there. Um, I don't know. They're just not out there too much. The only time I see pop-ups crop up for people that I work with here at Rock Valley and uh, throughout the day is people that, and students, is people that download the toolbars. The toolbars for the web browsers, you know, there's like umpteen amount of them, and all of them have pop-ups on. Uh, and what's sad to say is, you know, like even Google, like if you download Google Chrome, it has tons of toolbars in there once you to install. Like five or six of them. I don't know. It's like, what? And so, uh, you know, to uncheck all this stuff you don't want. Usually created by advertisers. And yes, Google does make money by advertisers. And so it makes sense that they have all these toolbars. Pop-up blockers uh, incorporated in the browser usually. Um, so, again, not too much anymore. And then firewalls. Um you're going to have the software-based firewalls, the hardware-based firewalls like Barracuda. Um, zone alarms, one I'll mention. I'll, I recommend you playing with at home. It's a cool, it's a cool one because you can actually see what it's doing as it's doing it. It's very cumbersome. It takes it takes over your machine while it's learning. But what's the cool thing about it is you actually get to see stuff as it's coming in that you never knew was coming into your machine. And you're like, do you want this to come in? Yes. Do you want this to come in? Yes. Do you want this? No. You know, as it comes in, you see it. And so just, you know, just install to see that happen for 10 minutes or whatever, and then you can uninstall it. 
Uh, but zone alarm free version, I recommend playing with to see how that works and how that traffic is coming in your machine. But firewalls basically are, allow, are designed to prevent malicious attacks coming in, malicious packets from entering or leaving your computer, maybe hardware or software based. And host based software firewalls run on a local system like Microsoft has their built in firewall, uh, Zone Alarm would be a client based firewall. But then you have such like Barracuda, which would be a hardware firewall off of your computer that uh, could be used as well. And then Microsoft Windows 7 firewall has three designations. You might have seen this pop up when you connect it to a new Wi Fi uh, public home or work. Okay, okay, what do I select? If it's something you believe, or bless you, if it's something you trust, public's fine. If it's something you have no clue about, um, I always recommend the work because it's going to be a kind of a more limited uh, type of thing. Uh, take it back. Logic is reversed there. Public would be something you don't trust as much. Work would be something you do trust. Um, home is home. The only two I ever use, by the way, is public and work. Public for those things that, you know, um, are, uh, let's say, I don't know, McDonald's Wi-Fi is an example. Public. Um, work, home, I do it. And here at Rock Valley, I do work. Okay. And what it does is on those networks, it actually opens up protocols, uh, like for instance on the work, to where it opens up all the file sharing aspects of networking, where I can share everything with you guys in here in Wi-Fi. But if I if I use the public, it shuts down those stuff, and I have to open them up individually. It's not just open for anybody to see my folders and files. I'll end on this one: logging. Most people don't know this, but in Microsoft, um, I will actually uh, one of these weeks we'll go in to look at the monitor of your log on Windows. Uh, it's actually in, uh, you right click on your computer on Windows and go into management. You can view all the logs of your Windows machine. And in fact, I'll switch over right now to this one. Let's see if I can show you real quick. We'll play with that as, we, as we're finishing up here. And you might have been to this before, might not have. Uh, the way I use it in IT is, um, if I suspect somebody trying to tamper or log into a machine off hours. Um, I will a lot of times go to the log of that machine in Windows to see what's going on in the system logs. So what you want to do is go to your Windows icon, right click on computer, go to manage. So again, Windows icon, right click on computer, go to manage. If you do have a computer icon on your desktop, you can just right click on computer, go to manage. And you'll notice here on the left side, uh, there is one of them, which is Event Viewer. An Event Viewer is going to have in here custom views, Windows logs, applications, and service logs, and subscriptions. The one I always play with here is Windows logs. These are built in specifically for what I just mentioned earlier, uh, logging into a uh, computer. We'll set up an audit every time somebody logs in to that computer. You notice on this screen, um, there is multiple login and logout sessions. If there was a fail login or logout session, it would say uh, it would be red key, and it would say a failed attempt. And so, say somebody's, I'm, I'm suspecting somebody's logging into a machine, and you say, well, how do you suspect it? Sally calls me on Tuesday morning and says, a user is up on my machine called administrator. Did you? Do you guys, did you guys come in last night and come into my machine or whatever? And so I check around and say, hey guys, did we go into Sally's machine last night? No, no, I didn't do that. That's a red flag because hackers will always use either guest or administrator. Those two usernames will usually uh, be the two that they'll forget to clear out uh, before they're done um, trying to attempt to get in the machine. And where it's going to show up here is in the log. And it'll actually show, um, see if I can find one here that's not successful. <clears throat> Let's go with, uh, probably all successful. Anyways, if there was one that was failed, it would show up in red. It'd be a red line, say it failed, failed that out. 
go that time. But anyway, what, what I do is basically, if you don't want to mess around with coming in that night or whatever to check it out, you can put a camera on that machine. Um, and there's a lot of cool cameras out today. I'll show you one we use. Why not? I'll show you a little secrets here. Um, this one right here. I'll pass it around. This is pretty cool. Um, this is a uh, Kodak uh, camera. It's portable. And it's got a magnet on the bottom. And the battery in that will last like six hours, seven hours. And I've got an SD card in there uh, that will hold about three or four or five hours of video continuous. And so uh, anyway, once you turn it on, you can put it, point it towards anything. Uh, it's strong enough actually to mount on the roof of your car and drive around. I mean, that's how strong the magnet is on it. Is it good quality or is it like... It's, yeah, it's really, it's HD quality. Yeah, it's, it's high GoPro? definition. A, do what up? Is it like GoPro? It's got, yeah, a very cheap version of GoPro, for sure. Yeah, it's, and it's, uh, let's see, I think it costs uh, 80 bucks, something like that. Does that uh, fisheye look like the GoPro does? It doesn't, no. It looks just, right, it's just a regular, uh, you know, 16 by 9 video. It's good quality, though, but we use those anytime we want to. We put it in a cabinet in the back of the room or uh, on the, you know, most cubicles have, have cabinets. And so you put it up there underneath the cabinet and, you know, the user doesn't know. It does record both video and audio. And so something like that you can set up in those areas to determine uh, who's been accessing something they shouldn't be accessing. And you don't have to come in that night. And then you can catch them on tape. Uh, red-handed get a candid camber moment for them that they probably didn't think that they were going to have and a little surprise the next day and so uh yeah that one actually let me see if i can pull that up real quick and that way you'll have the exact um uh, it's kodak but um did you order that online or did you order i did order online yeah i can't remember it's a square i can't remember the name of it it's just cube i think kodak cube I've had it for about four months. Yeah, Polaroid. I'm sorry, I said Kodak. It's Polaroid Cube. Polaroid Cube. You guys remember Polaroid, right? Yeah. The old, you know, they still sell those uh, old Polaroid cameras too, by the way. Um, it yeah, it is weatherproof. Like bucks. Yeah, I think it can rain on or something like that. But uh, yeah, it's around $100. And let's go and see here. Where I'm, I think I got mine on Amazon. Yeah, I'm on there right now. Yeah, Amazon is the one I recommend getting it. Um, get one of these to watch my kids. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, but that's what I definitely recommend is uh, through. Um, and probably because I'm putting in Kodak instead of Polaroid. There it is. And they have different colors too. I got the blue one. They also have a black and red one. And if you have Prime, if you have Prime, um, if you have Prime, it's free shipping. And they have some cool accessories too. They do have a waterproof case. This is a, this will hold like rain and stuff. And finally, you know, you can't submerge or anything, but like you know, water and rain or whatever, moisture, snow, whatever. It's not going to hurt it. But this one here does that. They have a Polaroid case for twenty four ninety nine. And I think that's the only accessory on this one. I did see some other stands and stuff on here, I thought. Yeah, suction cup one, uh, keychain, strap mount for a cube, uh, action camera. So a whole bunch of different ones they have, different accessories it looks like they have for it. Helmet mount for a cube camera, kind of like a GoPro type thing, I guess. But the quality's pretty good. And 100 bucks, pretty, pretty inexpensive. So the main thing tonight is, Securing your area, finding out ways to get those, uh, get that secure log to um, catch the intruder, and then using a camera like this or something. And there's different ones out there too. You can buy ones at Best Buy. Uh, this one we liked because it was mobile and we could put it anywhere and didn't really need special software for it. There's a little screw on the back of it that you can unscrew, and then it has a micro SD, or the way we use it, just a, uh, a mini USB, plug it into the Mac or PC, and it dumps the video, and it also charges it too with that. So, Is cool. Storage? Do what else? Besides the SD? No, no storage besides the SD. So you have to get a, I think we have a 16 gig, but we have, there's another one we had as a 32 gig 
uh, S micro SD, which holds a lot of video. So, what about night vision? Do you want to? Night, night vision? Uh, no. No night vision. Nope. But it's really good quality. High, high quality video, for sure. Definitely recommend it. All right, so Thursday when you guys come in, we're going to do man and mill attack, and uh, that's when you'll come in. I'll, I'll know I'll use Daniel Machines, what I usually do, and I'm using those of you who had PHP or web programming, you might have heard of a program called ZAMP. We'll be using ZAMP as the uh, app to run the um, man in the middle attack from the attacker's perspective. We'll be doing what's called art poisoning. And then when you guys come in, I'll have you log in to www.facebook.com, put in a bogus, and I stress bogus because I will be collecting <laughs> usually passwords for a few minutes. I'll stop the attack. We'll come over to my machine and show you how it's done. All right? We'll see you Thursday.